hello. Um, I missed you guys, and this is going to be our lecture, our first lecture on rotational motion, so that you guys can continue to move forward, even though I am not here. Uh, chapter eight is on rotational motion. You have already read about it, which is one of my favorite chapters of the year. Um, so let's get right into it. Basically, we have rotational motion, and um, for every quantity in rotational motion, there is a uh, quantity in translational motion that is similar. So for instance, if I have a translational position, which we have already learned, out, learned about and we know great deals about, um, I call that X, I measure it in meters, I can have an angular position as well. So if you think about something rotating or moving in a circle, um, that object can be at a certain rotational point, and that angular position is called theta. And we measure theta in radians. So you should already know this from your math classes. Um, <clears throat> until this point, you have had your calculators in degree mode for everything physics. Well, that's going to change. I'll let you soak that in. Uh, you have to now decide whether you need to be in radian mode or degree mode and put your calculator in the correct mode. Um, so we have velocity um, and the angular component of velocity or the angular term is angular velocity and that's in radians per second. So that tells you um, how many radians an object will rotate through every second. Then we have angular acceleration, and that's in radians per second squared. So this is the rate of change of angular velocity, just as acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Next, we have torque. And torque causes angular acceleration, just as force causes translational acceleration. Torque is measured in Newton meters. And the symbol for torque is tau, which is a Greek symbol. It's a T uh, with a top and a curl at the bottom. Next, we have moment of inertia or rotational inertia. The unit of that is kilogram times meter squared. And this um, determines the resistance to change in angular motion. So if you think about how um, mass determines the resistance to changes in motion, so if something is more massive, it is harder to change its motion. It is harder to get it moving if it uh, stops, and it's harder to stop it if it's already moving. Rotational inertia uh, is similar in that something with a lot of rotational inertia will be hard to begin spinning or hard to stop spinning. And something with a small amount of rotational inertia will be easier to start spinning or stop spinning. And we use torque to rotate things. So we're going to talk about um, each of these in more detail as we go through this. And then um, you'll kind of get an idea of what these quantities are today, and you'll start applying them a little bit in your um, homework problems and questions. And then when I get back, we will go into more depth with each of these. So each of these quantities, um, we have a linear form, basically, and an angular form. We can apply all of our equations of kinematic motion to angular motion as well. So the equation formats are exactly the same. We could do all the same uh, experiments that we did to um, derive the equations in translational motion. We could do those same experiments just with something rotating and we would get these equations. We're not going to do all of those, but uh, we will do some. So just notice that um, anytime there's a V for velocity in translational motion, we've replaced it with an omega 
for um, angular velocity in rotational motion. Anytime there's an A for acceleration in translational motion, we've replaced it with an alpha for angular acceleration in rotational motion. Time remains the same, um, but position it, as an X in translational motion is replaced with a theta in rotational motion. And finally, force in translational motion is replaced with um, a, the symbol for torque, which is a tau. So instead of F equals MA, we have tau equals I times alpha. And I is the symbol for mom moment of inertia. I don't think I said that earlier. It is written up there, though. This is posted, so I'm going to keep going. If you still need to write things down, you can go visit this on my YouTube channel tonight. All right, so I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. Actually, I'm going to have uh, the, the video paused here. But what I want you to do is use the door of a cabinet near your table. And I want you to determine what two factors affect torque. So open the door, and when you open the door, the door rotates. The door has a pivot at the hinges, and that pivot causes the door to swing open, and the door rotates open. So you can use um, the door to think about what factors affect the torque that you place on the door. Now remember that torque will affect the angular acceleration. So play around with um, what you do to the door to make it accelerate in an angular fashion at different angular acceleration rates, and then uh, make a list of things that affect torque. Please do not damage the doors as we do this. You can pause the video now and take some time to do that. All right, so what you should have found is that the force that you place on the door and the distance the force is applied from the pivot affect the torque, which affects the angular acceleration. So for example, if you are pulling on the handle of the door to open it, if you apply a greater force on that handle, then it will accelerate angularly at a greater rate. You are applying a greater torque on the door. If you apply a force on the handle to close it, or at the handle's area to close it, um, and then you apply that same force halfway across the door, so halfway between the handle and the um, Uh, the pivot, I don't know why I'm blanking on what that's called, the hinges, uh, halfway between, if you apply that force halfway between the handle and the hinges, you will see that the door accelerates at a slower rate. So you're applying less torque when the distance between the force you apply on the door and the hinges is smaller. If you increase the distance between the force you apply on the door and the hinges, you will, in you will increase your torque on the door. So we call the distance between the pivot and the force a radius. And we call, we call the um, force that we apply on the door a force. And then we put a sine theta in there because um, you should notice that you have to pull outward on the handle to open the door. You pull at a 90 degree angle to the door to open it. If you pulled on the door handle at a, a zero degree angle with the hinges, you would not be able to open it. And the sign of zero is zero. So you would apply no torque on the door if you push on the door handle um, parallel to the radius. If 
you pull on the door handle perpendicular to the radius, so you're pulling in a direction that is perpendicular to the actual face of the door, then the angle between R and F is 90 degrees, and you are uh, applying a torque, your maximum torque. You could also apply a force at an angle between 90 and 0 or 90 and 180, um, and this equation would tell you what torque you're applying on the door. So torque is equal to radius times force times sine of theta. Next, let's talk about the moment of inertia or the rotational inertia. I'll give you the equation for the moment of inertia of a particle. The moment of inertia of a particle is equal to mass times radius squared. So m is mass, and r is the distance from the pivot. So what this means is that two things can have the exact same mass and have different rotational inertia. I have set out two sets of long gray uh, pipes on the front counter. So somebody come up and grab them and start passing them around the room. Keep the ones with the red tape together and the ones with the white tape together. You should notice that if you hold these in the center, so put one of these pipes in each hand and you hold them in the center, you hold them vertically so that the pipes are vertical, they feel like they're the same mass because they are indeed the same mass. Then if you try to twist them, you will find that one of them is much easier to twist. It's much easier to cause angular acceleration on one of the pipes than the other. And that's because of the placement of the masses. Masses that are placed further from the pivot take more torque to create the angular acceleration. So you have one of those bars, and I have placed masses on the end like this. So the mass is farther from the pivot point. The other bar that I've given you that looks identical from the outside and feels identical if you hold them still has its masses closer to the pivot. So it is easier to rotate. It has a smaller moment of inertia or a smaller rotational inertia. So if we call this one A and this one B, the rotational inertia of A is greater than the rotational inertia of B. Also remember that the moment of inertia is the proportionality constant between the angular acceleration and net force. So torque equals I alpha. So given a constant torque, if your angular um, inertia is increased, what will happen to your angular acceleration? It will decrease and vice versa. So they are inversely proportional, just like when we did our lab with mass versus acceleration uh, when we were studying Newton's second law. We found that mass and acceleration were inversely proportional. Moment of inertia and angular acceleration are also inversely proportional. So we have um, moment of inertia, and there are different equations for the moment of inertia for uh, different objects. And when you take calculus-based physics, you'll have the pleasure and joy of uh, really figuring out where all these equations come from. But until that time, uh, there is a chart in your book. I have included this one. I don't think this is the one in your book. But um, I've included a chart of different objects that are common and the equations for the moments of inertia of these objects. So you'll notice that 
I said a particle, the moment of inertia of a particle is mr squared, right? So if I have a cylindrical shell, that's kind of like a lot of little particles put together. And so um, the moment of inertia of a cylindrical shell is just mr squared. But as soon as I add depth to that shell, so now I have radius one and radius two, and that shell has a thickness to it, then the particles that are closer to the pivot, they have a smaller rotational inertia. They're easier to accelerate than the particles that are farther from the pivot. Therefore, we have to uh, make the uh, equation a little more complicated. And the equation becomes 1 half times the mass times parentheses r1 squared plus r2 squared. And so it goes on from there. Um, if I have a full cylindrical shell, if I have my particles in the very middle, um, those particles actually have no rotational inertia. Those particles that are in the exact center where the radius is zero. And so um, they have no rotational inertia, but the particles that are out here have a lot of rotational inertia. And then the ones in the middle uh, have somewhere in between. So our equation for that one is one half mr squared. And you guys can kind of uh, look through those other equations. You'll need to look these up on occasion to do a problem, um, but it's pretty much just a thing that's given to you at this point in your your physics base of knowledge. All right, one last thing here. I'm going to just do an example problem for you. So uh, we're using our angular quantities, um, but we're using them in the same manner that we use translational quantities. So it's not like it's a completely new thing. You guys already know all of this. Uh, just remember that all of your thetas act like x's, all of your omegas act like z's, all of your alphas act like a's, all of your taus act like f's for force, and all of your i's act like m, m's for mass. Uh, all right, so we have a propeller blade, which can be treated like a thin rod, um, and it has a mass of 40 kilograms and a length of 2 meters. If the engine applies a torque of 500 newton meters, how long does it take the propeller to reach 2,000 rotations per minute? Uh, RPM stands for rotations per minute, so that's another thing we're going to have to going to have to address. Let's start off by drawing a picture of what's going on. Uh, we have some propellers and they are rotating around. Uh, we know that together they are two meters long. We know that the mass is equal to 40 kilograms and we need to know the moment of inertia. It says that we can treat it as a thin rod and it's being rotated around the middle, so the middle of the pivot. So if we go back to our uh, list of equations, we can see that this is the equation we're going to use. The moment of inertia is equal to 1 12th ml squared. So we write our moment of inertia equation, 1 12th ml squared, and L is the length of that rod. So let's go ahead and calculate that out. We have 1 12th times 40 kilograms times 2 meters squared, and that's going to give us 13.3 kilogram meters squared. We also know that the torque is equal to 500 newton meters, and we know it starts at rest, so initial angular velocity is zero, and its final angular velocity is 2,000 RPM. Now RPM is kind of like miles per hour. It's a unit that we need to convert um, in order to actually work with usually. So we need to convert this into radians per second, and to do that, we're gonna think about um, what RPM means. So this means rotations, per minute. So 
So the minute's easy to get rid of. We know that in one minute, we have 60 seconds. And then we need to get rid of the rotation. And we need to turn it into radian. So one rotation is equal to two pi radian. <coughs> Excuse me. And then when we do this conversion, our rotations will cancel, our minutes will cancel, and we get radians per second. So we get uh, 209.4 radians per second. I'm so used to asking if there are any questions. I almost asked if there are any questions. There might be, but I can't answer them. All right, so now we get to start solving things. We have a bunch of unknowns, and we are a bunch of knowns, and we are looking for uh, the time it takes for the propeller to reach the final angular velocity. We're going to start off by finding what our angular acceleration is. Uh, so I know that alpha is equal to tau over i because um, just like acceleration would equal force over mass, angular acceleration is equal to torque over uh, moment of inertia. And then I plug in my 500 newton meters and I divide by 13.3 kilogram meters squared. And that gives me 37.5 radians per second squared. There's my angular acceleration. Next, I can use a, um, an equation with my omegas to figure out what my time is. So I know that change in omega is equal to angular acceleration times time. So change in angular velocity is equal to angular acceleration times time, just as change in velocity is equal to acceleration times time. And I'm going to rearrange that to solve for t. So I get change in angular velocity over angular acceleration. And then I'm going to plug in numbers. So my final angular velocity is 209.4 radians per second. My initial angular velocity was 0. And then I divide by my angular acceleration, which is 37.5 radians per second squared. And then I get 5.6 seconds. Um, I want to show you what happens with the units so that you can see that our units are, in fact, um, seconds here. And I kind of want to show you that from the top. So I didn't do it up here. Um, here we have Newton up here, we have newton meters over kilogram meters squared. So I know that a newton is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. And then I multiply that by another meter. And then I divide by a kilogram and a meter squared. So we can see that our meters cancel and our kilograms cancel. And we're left with one over second squared. And remember that radian is not really a unit, it's just kind of uh, a placeholder for us. So those, um, those units work out. Okay, so that's your example problem, um, and that's your introduction into rotational motion. Have a really great day, enjoy your weekend, hopefully I'll see you next week.